Trinity United Methodist Church. We're glad that you're here, whether you're joining us online or in person or out in the parking lot. We just have a few announcements for you. We like to remind you that our mission focus of this month is Vacation Bible School, so hopefully by the summer we'll be able to get our kids back together again and start doing some education. And then just a reminder that our prayer chain is available and Lynn Wiles is the contact person. And if you are not getting messages and would like them, contact the office. If you're getting messages and would rather not be on that system, just contact the office as well. Just a reminder that our next finance and trustee meeting is May 11th. And then we are accepting applications for scholarship if you're a senior or graduating and getting ready to go to college or trade school. And then just a reminder that our United Methodist Women will be meeting on May 10th at 1 o'clock, and that will be in the Upper Fellowship Hall, and we'll try to keep social distance and wear your mask. Let's go ahead and worship.
this week I was reminded of something in the scripture of how important it is for all of us to work together. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 4, it says, Just as each of us have one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same function, so in Christ we are many, we form one body, and each member belongs to the others. And we all have different gifts according to the grace that God's given us. And it goes on to say that some teach and some serve and some do other things. And with our funeral that we had yesterday, it was really nice because we had the United Methodist women that prepared a meal. We had people that were ushers that were welcoming to the funeral home and got them able to come in early. And it's really good that we have a church, that we all have different functions and all work together to make things happen. So let's pray. Dear Gracious Lord, we just thank you for Trinity Church, our ability to work together and to do our gifts and use our talents to make a difference for others. Help us to continue to work together in unity and to make a difference and to bring more people to know you and love you. In your name we pray. Amen.
Because whenever people are in proximity with each other, conflict is a natural byproduct of human beings and human relating. So the question that we're trying to answer is not how to avoid conflict, but instead the question is, what do we do when conflict arises? How do we respond to conflict? How do we resolve conflict in a healthy way? Now last week we talked about the cost of conflict and we said unresolved conflict in our lives or in the inability to resolve conflict in healthy ways costs us a whole lot more than we realize. And last week we mentioned three of those and their personal wellness, relational wholeness, and also spiritual righteousness. So in this series, what we hope to do is walk through eight steps to conflict resolution. And these are not things that I made up. These steps actually come from the Bible. And they specifically come from Jesus' teaching in Matthew 18. Matthew 18 is known as the premier passage on conflict resolution. In fact, if you start at verse 15, it says, if a brother sins against you, this is what you're supposed to do. This is what you do when somebody offends you, and, or what do you do when somebody hurts you? What do you do when someone sins against you? Well, Jesus goes through and he gives us practical steps on how to resolve conflict. So I'm going to kind of give you an outline of Matthew 18 because it looks really disjointed. The first thing, it starts off with a, a question that the disciples ask Jesus. And then the second one is, there's a little thing about children in there, because everything that Jesus says in chapter 18 comes as a response to this question that the disciples are asking. Then it talks about something about amputation, where you cut off your hand or gouge out your eye. That should be interesting. <laughs> and it has some sheep, and then confrontation of what do you do when somebody sins against you. And then at the end is a story of this guy who's really unmerciful. Now again, it look, at first glance, it looks very disjointed. So some people have a tendency to take sound bites and take them out of context. But I believe when we look at this, they're all related. Each of these points help enlighten the other. And each of these points support Jesus' logic and the heart behind his conflict resolution. So let's go ahead and start at verse 1. If you feel comfortable, you can read this with me. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? <coughs> so everything again that Jesus says comes from this disciple's question. Now Matthew, again, is given an account of Jesus' life. But when we look at some of the parallel scripture, Luke gives us a little bit more insight into what's behind the question. And this is what Luke says. He says, an argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. So you can just imagine these disciples are asking this question to Jesus and they want to settle an argument. We've been talking about this over Easter that they've continually talking about who's the greatest. So this question comes from a place of conflict and they are trying to resolve a conflict. They're trying to settle this dispute. Well, you wonder, well, what prompted this question? Now, these disciples are just as human as you and I. These were not some special elite club of halo-wearing men. They were just average, sinful people. In fact, they were average, imperfect people. In fact, they, they say, a lot of the commentaries say that the disciples were called when they were teenagers. So can you imagine what it would be like having 12 ordinary men standing around every waking moment together? Now the natural byproduct is they would have some conflict, especially teenagers. Now I imagine it's kind of like youth group. They were friends, I imagine they laughed a lot. They probably even had some inside jokes with each other. And I can imagine that they probably smoked like a high school locker room. <laughs> and part of their humanity is that they are <coughs> And their main argument is who's the greatest? Which of us is the best? So they would be constantly jockeying around and trying to get ahead. They would make it an argument of why they thought they were best. I can just imagine Peter. Yeah, Jesus said I'm the rock. 
Oh, yeah, sure, Peter, but he also called you Satan. I'm John, not the disciple that Jesus loved. Well, John, you're also the son of thunder. Yeah, right. And Thomas? I doubt it. <laughs> but this is the context of Matthew's 18 conflict. This is the reason that they're asking the question for Jesus to settle account. They want to resolve who's best, so they say, well, let's go ask Jesus. So when they ask, it's like, so, Jesus, who is it? Who's the best? But here's what I want you to notice. Jesus does not answer the question the way that they hope. In fact, Jesus doesn't resolve their conflict. Instead, he confronts their thinking. This is what he says in verse 2. He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. Now imagine they're all arguing about who's the greatest. All of them are kind of lined up like they're getting ready to pick for a dodgeball game. Well, who's your first pick, Jesus? And Jesus pulls this little child and says, come. And commentators will say that he's probably holding a toddler or a little baby because in parallel stories, Jesus held a child. Because most of the time, you're not going to hold a 10-year-old. That would be kind of awkward. So Jesus brings this little child among them. Now you remember the way that Jesus taught was very creative. He would tell parables, he'd tell stories, and he would use object lessons. Well, in this case, Jesus is using an object lesson to make a spiritual point about a spiritual truth. So the question is, what spiritual truth is Jesus trying to convey? This is what it says in verse uh, 3 and 4. And he said, truly I tell you, Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes a lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is saying, unless you change. He's confronting the disciples in just the way that they're thinking. He's confronting not only the view about themselves, but also the view of others. He's confronting the way they view the conflict. And Jesus says, unless you change. Well, what in the world does Jesus mean? What's he saying? Jesus is saying the very first step in conflict resolution is to become like a child. Now, you're probably wondering, well, they're kind of acting childish right now. Is that what Jesus means? Now, to clarify, Jesus isn't saying that we have to be childish. Instead, he's saying we have to be more childlike. And there's a key characteristic in children that we need to emulate, that we need to pursue. Well, what is the trait that Jesus is referring to? And the Bible says, whoever took a lowly position. Now, Jesus is not saying that children are more innocent or that children are sinless. Amen? This trait refers to a lowly position. Now, some translations say you need to be as humble as a child. So in other words, Jesus is saying, if you want to be a person that lives in my kingdom, under my jurisdiction, if you want to live under my leadership, in my kingdom of peace, in my dominion of authority, you need to change the way that you think. You need to be humble. Now, some of what Jesus is saying gets lost in the translation just because of our different culture. The disciples are asking, well, who's the greatest in your kingdom? Well, who would be the greatest in the kingdom? It's the king, right? Amen? And then it's the people that have authority and position and high honor, those with dignity and also those with a bunch of money. And who was the lowest in the kingdom? Well, in that culture, it was children. Now, in our culture today, we kind of highly esteem kids, and we almost uh, value children's voices over those of adults. But that was not the way it was back in Jesus' time. In Jesus' time, children were the very lowest on the social ladder. In fact, in Galatians 4, children were viewed on the same par with slaves. Children had absolutely no rights, and they had no say in anything. Jesus is saying you have to be humble. So I have some quotes from three different commentators to clarify this. 
There's a quote from D.A. Carson. He's a professor and also a Bible commentator. And he says, this child is the model. In this context, it's not a model of faith, not of innocence or not purity, but of humility and unconcern for social status. Jesus assumed that people are not naturally like that, and they must change and become like little children. Now let me give you another one. This comes from Tyndale's New Testament commentary. And it says, this would have been a total reversal of human value scale. A child was a person of no importance in the Jewish society. They were sub subject to authority of their elders. They were not taken seriously except as responsibility. They were taken as one to be looked after, not one to be looked up to. To turn and become like little children is therefore a radical reorientation from the mentality of this rat race to this acceptance of insignificance. And then the third one, this is from Michael Wilkins. He's a contributor to the EVS uh, Bible study. And it says the humility of a child consists of childlike trust, vulnerability, and the inability to advance their own cause apart from help, direction, and resources of a parent. Now, all of these quotes have one thing in common, and it also points to the first step in conflict resolution. So step one in resolving conflict is to humble yourself. You have to start with the willingness to humble yourself. I think all of us know what Jesus is talking about, because when there's a conflict that we're facing, it's never just about that dispute. It's never just about that disagreement. In fact, there's probably always a third party present in every conflict, and it's known as pride. It's not only that we disagree, but it's also an issue of pride. Because pride screams, me first, my rights, my desires, my agenda first. Pride always comes out on top. We really don't want to, dis to settle a dispute. We want to be right. Now, it's funny because pride is so easy to see in everybody else. We can see pride in our spouse, in our children, our coworkers, and our friends. In fact, it infuriates us when we see this pride in them. Yet pride is so hard to see in the mirror. Pride is that thing that makes us unwilling to budge. Even if we may not be right, we want to press our point. If they want to resolve the conflict, they can call me. You know, the phone works in both ways. <clears throat> I wonder, why is it so very hard for us to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong? Friends, it's because of pride. And Jesus says if you want to resolve this conflict in a healthy way, the very first step is to look inside yourself and address that thing inside of you. Well, practically speaking, how do we do that? James, he's the younger brother of Jesus, he elaborates and clarifies what Jesus is talking about. So in chapter 4 he says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desire to battle within you? You desire, you do not have, so you kill. You covet and you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. I don't know about you, have you seen a consistent thing in this, a consistent theme? See that word you? It's listed eight times. James says there's something inside of you. There's something battling within you. What's inside of you that's causing conflict outside of you is you. James is saying, you know why all those conflicts that you face are to people that are nearest and dearest to you? It's because they're close to you. The reason that I have conflict with those that are closest to me is because they're near me. I want to say, no, it's something in them. Now, I don't think that James is saying that's the only problem, but James says at the heart and cause of every single conflict that you've ever had with any person in your whole life, there is a desire within you that you're not getting what you want. In every conflict, you want something. 
and you're not getting what you want. So you fight and conflict arises. Now, just imagine the difference it would make if you just, in the tension and the conflict, if you humbled yourself. So before you make this charge or demand of what I want or what I need, what if we just pause and say, you know what? Part of the problem is I'm not getting what I want. I think all of us have experienced this. But when humility enters a conflict, it has this powerful, disarming effect. I don't know, maybe you have a friend that you haven't talked with for days or months. But just imagine if one of the parties steps out and humbles themselves. Doesn't that make a difference? This is what Jesus and James say, the very first step, and not the only step, is just the willingness to humble yourself. He said, rather than pointing your fingers at the other person, look in the mirror. <clears throat> now, I know there are some people that are pushing back and saying, well, you don't know my situation. Some people say, you know what? It's not a want or a desire. Those people owe me. They made a promise. They didn't come through on their promise. <coughs> Excuse me. We had an agreement. We signed a contract. They're not keeping their end of the deal. They made a vow to death do us part. They cheated. They left. I'm not talking about desire. That person owes me. Now, you know what? I don't want to minimize this because some people have been severely wronged by another person. Some of you have been hurt and harmed in such a way that the person didn't keep their end of the deal. And, and I'm not trying to minimize that. But at the same time, that doesn't minimize what James is saying here. He's saying even if that is the case, James is saying that the heart of the conflict is still something that you're not getting. James says we're not minimizing this hurt and the pain. But he's saying you have to be willing to pause and humble yourself. Part of the conflict, you have to admit, is I'm not getting what I want. Now, some of you may push back again and say, well, it's not fair. I would say this, be careful with that fair card, because we only throw out the fair card when we're at the disadvantage. I mean, we never throw out the fair card when we're on the good side of the unfair. Now, you've all been in this position where you go to the grocery store, it's really crowded, there's two checkout lanes, and you just happen this week to get in the line that's going twice as fast as the other line. And instead of saying, oh, this is so unfair, they had to wait twice as long as I did. <laughs> instead, you think, huh, God must be with me today. <laughs> you know, fairness left when sin entered the world, friends. <laughs> So we need to recognize that part of conflict is from unmet desires. I want to say this the best way we can. When we have an unmet desire in our heart, and these unmet desires are powerful things, and whether this unmet desire is legitimate or not, these unmet desires become deserves or entitlement, and we become controlled by those desires, and we allow them to control us. What happens when we say, I deserve, all of a sudden we cling to this identity of victimhood. We'll say, well, they didn't give me what I desire, what I deserve. And we use this victimhood as an excuse to justify hurtful and harmful behavior towards ourselves and others. We use it as an excuse to say, I'm never going to forgive them. And we cling to this bitterness and resentment and we hold on tight to the things that we desire and deserve. And we say, I'm going to blame and I'm never going to be happy. <clears throat> and all the while, we're just hurting ourselves. And some of us, friends, are locked in prisons of bitterness, unforgiveness, and resentment. And we look at the other person, we say, it's because of them. But when we do that, we give them all kinds of power in our lives. But here's the thing, 
God wants us to be free. He wants us to experience peace. He wants us to be free of conflict that's happening within us. And James and Jesus both agree that you start here. Now, it's not the end, but you can't do the next step until you start here. That you have to be humble enough to say, you know, I'm not getting what I want. But Lord, help me to examine my heart. What is it that I want that I'm not getting? And then you have to ask, how am I contributing to this issue? Now, some of you are thinking, wow, I wish my spouse were here to, were here to hear this. Or, you know, I wish my friend were here to hear this. Well, you know what? There you go again. James goes on to say, you do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. So he's saying you, you, don't, you don't have what you desire, and that's what's causing the conflict. James is saying, has it ever occurred to you that before you go demanding a thing from another person of what you want, maybe you just ought to talk to your Heavenly Father about it. Maybe go to God and have Him search your desires. Has it ever occurred to you that you might be wrong or your desires might be wrong? Or maybe your desires are wrongly placed. Maybe the one thing that you desire from the other person, maybe they don't have the ability to fulfill. Maybe you're demanding something that only God can satisfy. So when you go to God, ask him for what you want. I mean, wasn't that the problem in the first place? That you ask for your desires from other people rather than from God? Or ask God for desires rather than have them change your heart? Now, if, if, if I ask you, in the conflict that you're facing right now, are you praying for the other person? Are you praying in your conflict? Because that's a good place to start. Now, I'll ask somebody, I'm like, are you praying? And they'll say, yeah. And I'll say, well, what? Well, I'm just praying that God will show them the error of their ways. I'm praying that they'll come and realize that I'm right and they're wrong. I'm praying that they'll do what I want. But James is so insightful. He says, instead of going to God and asking him to give you the thing you want, he said, ask God for your desires and to search your heart. And then ask, Lord, what is my contribution in this? Lord, help fix my heart. Help put the right desires in me. And then James ends by saying, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Again, it goes back to the first step in conflict resolution, which is to humble ourselves. We have to pause. And instead of pointing fingers, we need to look in the mirror. So what are some practical ways that we can take away from this week's message? And here's some challenges. First, pray and ask God to search your heart. You know, what are the unmet desires that you're contributing to conflict in your life that you're facing? And then the second one is come back next week for step two. Because maybe this week you'll be praying and you'll realize, you know what, I do have part in this conflict. And you might say, well, what do I do now? So step two is next week. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for not leaving us on our own to resolve this conflict. And Lord, thank you for giving us a way out of this vicious cycle. We know that you desire that we find peace and joy even in the midst of conflict. Help us to be people of humility. And Lord, even if that other party is not, help us to be. And thank you for being a prime example of humility for the sake of our health and our salvation. And Lord, for those in church that are imprisoned by their bitterness and unforgiveness and resentment, we just ask that you set them free. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Josie. We come to our time of uh, prayers and concerns, so if you would bow your head. Dear gracious Lord, we just lift up the family of Eileen Eastep, especially this week with all of them traveling. We ask that you give them mercy and just help them, help them through the grieving process. And just uh, bless Roy and help him through his transition and his new way of life. We also lift up the David Knotts family. This is uh, Perry Help and Perry Patty Knotts' husband. And we just, again, ask that you would send people to surround her and to uh, bless her and be with her and, and be a spiritual presence to her. We also lift up Charlotte Snyder and Connie Evans that have some blood issues and bone issues. And Lord, we're just asking that you give the doctors wisdom and discernment in the directions that they need to go. And we lift up Joyce Swanson's son, Ryan, that has some eyesight issues. And again, we ask that you give the doctors wisdom and discernment and that they're able to uh, make a difference because we know how valuable our eyesight is. Lord, we lift up Mark Lyon that's having some health issues. It's been about a month since he's had his surgery. And we just ask that you continue to uh, strengthen him and repair his, his bones and his, his muscles. We lift up Marie Garten that's still having some breathing issues from COVID. And Lord, we just thank you for the vaccine and we just ask that you still give the doctors and researchers wisdom in, in preventing this from happening and also from helping cure those that have been afflicted with that. We thank you for Tom Phelps' surgery that uh, is um, successful and that he'll also have some surgery in the future. We just ask that you would guide the doctor's hands and their instruments and that all would go well. From Chris Jukic, we lift up Eileen Raymond that has some serious health issues, and Megan Jukic that is still in the hospital, that uh, she had an MRI that has, uh, so she has some bulging discs that's got to be really painful. And also Pat, Chris's cousin, uh, cousin, that has not felt well for over a week. And Lord, we know that you care about all these issues and that you're more concerned about people than we are. And we ask that you bring healing and, and shalom. And for those that have unspoken prayers, whether it's physical, emotional, or spiritual, we ask that you bring your peace and your guidance and show favor to those in the church. Would you join me in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's join in singing. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. We could stand up if you'd like.
may you look to yourself this week and see if there's any conflict that's unresolved and maybe look and see what part you have in it and what is that unmet desire. And come back again next week. Go in peace. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.